Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry, and it's my pleasure to have today an individual who has joined us here in the Marianas this week for the Marianas Tourism Education Council Tourism Summit that gathered over 200 young people from local MyWave clubs at the Fiesta Resort on Thursday. He is actually also the immediate past chairman of the Pacific Asia Travel Association and guardian of Sanctuary Resorts, Mr. Andrew Jones. Andrew, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, it's wonderful to be here. It's my first time to Saipan, and I'm, I really enjoyed the time that I've been spending here and had the opportunity to see a little bit of Saipan and attend the summit today. Um, it was a great event. I have to say I was really impressed with the whole uh, activity. Uh, it was wonderful to interact with the young people of the community and, and see what they're doing uh, in terms of the My Wave Club uh, activities and how they are really appreciating their heritage and culture while also taking care of the environment. Uh, that's true. The theme of the conference this year was Love Your Culture, L Live Your Culture, Love All Cultures, and uh, the kids responded very well to that. Now, you normally speak to a little bit more mature audience, maybe a little more professional. But how was it um, hearing from the kids and, and interacting with the kids this week? Yeah, uh, that's very true. Um, and I was a little bit daunted by the... Uh, uh, by the challenge of, of trying to make it fun and exciting because, you know, young people are looking for those sort of uh, qualities, I think, in terms of presentations. But, but it was really interesting because we did seem to connect and interact well. Um, and, of course, nowadays with social media and other aspects of, um, of communications, uh, it's about finding a mutual uh, level of understanding on these matters and then sharing the feelings, the thoughts and experiences. And, you know, I'm, I'm originally from England and um, grew up in the hotel business there and I've traveled through many different cultures, whether it's Canadian or through Asia and, and the Pacific areas now. So it was good to, to showcase some of that and to show them some of the experiences and hopefully they gained some insight into the way other people responded to some of the issues that, that they're obviously experiencing in their educational process. I'd like to point out that we've actually had the opportunity to do some sightseeing with you uh, the last couple of days and we're taping this here at Pow Pow Beach so if there are any random bird noises going on you know there's not sound effects added to this interview. What have been your impressions of Saipan? Well, um, as I say, I've only been here for just over two days now, but I, I really um, was impressed because the first port of call, if you like, was the museum. And it was a really interesting uh, visit to the museum because it had so much about the heritage and culture of Saipan, and I could learn a lot about the island within a short period of time. And it was really well put together and I did learn a lot and then to go out into the countryside and see some of these sites um, you know visually and, and uh, in real time was was really unique and I think there are some really unique and interesting places for tourists to come and see with a lot of potential. Well let's talk a little bit about your um, regular work. We mentioned that you are with PATA. For those that are not familiar um, what is PATA? And, w or, and how does it relate to the Marianas? Well, uh, PATA is a trade association. Um, it's an association of tour and travel companies and, and also government officials. So we're the only association that brings the public and private sectors together to discuss the issues of the industry and to help promote tourism to, from and within the Asia-Pacific region. And we do have a PATA Micronesia chapter um, which Saipan is a part of, and, um, and through our communications from the headquarters in Bangkok and the Pacific Asia Travel 
chapter in uh, Micronesia, we are able to share information, knowledge and experiences to help support and encourage those tourism activities in the different locations and, and swap uh, experiences from different cultures and different uh, uh, places uh, that will help support tourism, uh, responsible and sustainable tourism development in these places. You mentioned uh, Pata Micronesia, which of course is composed of the um, state or national tourism offices of all the Micronesian entities, um, the CNMI, Guam, Federated States of Micronesia, Marshalls, um, uh, Palau, and then along with uh, private businesses that are s wanting to support the tourism industry, maybe they're hotels or, or tour operators, and this is actually an organization that is open to anybody who's interested in joining it, and so we want to take this opportunity, if anybody is interested in learning more about uh, Pata Micronesia, um, to look them up online, or um, if you're interested in membership, you can contact um, Judy Torres at the Marianas Visitors Authority. Um, talking about building tourism in the region. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, I mean, although it is a, an Asia-Pacific focused association, we have chapters all over the world. We have a New York chapter, we have a, a Finnish uh, chapter in Finland, uh, we have a London chapter in, for the UK. So it is a global, in a way, organization, um, but our focus is obviously for the Asia-Pacific region to help promote the tourism uh, industry in those areas. Now, uh, coming to Saipan this week is actually not your first visit to Micronesia and you you kind of have discovered Micronesia recently. I actually started, I actually, my first visit to Guam was about 20 years ago just for a short, for a short trip. But then um, I, uh, Pata held the annual summit in Guam in 2016, which was the year that I was elected to the Pata chairmanship. Um, and that sort of fueled my, I say, re, re interest in the Pacific area. And after that, I've also had the opportunity to go to Ponape and uh, to Yap last year. Uh, for the homecoming event and so you know the the lure or the draw of the Pacific Ocean you know is calling to me I feel. Well that's awesome it's been really great to hear you share your uh, insights w with the students and also the Hotel Association of the NMI while you were here. Um, you mentioned um, uh, during our tour uh, and I think you mentioned to the kids that you actually started working in this industry when you were only 12 years old. This, was this child labor or what, what is the story behind that? Yeah, no, actually, Catherine, my, fair, my parents, uh, they ran a, a pub restaurant in the UK. So I grew up in, in the hotel business. They also then moved on to a uh, country inn um, uh, establishment. So I grew up in, in the business. Uh, helping the family run the business and then I became a chef and then I went into uh, hotels and uh, worked my way up through the different departments in the hotel and then across from England to Bermuda to Canada and then eventually to Hong Kong and Korea and I've stayed in the Asia Pacific region ever since so I've been in Asia Pacific for over 30, 33 years now. And you've actually managed some pretty large hotels. Well, yeah, the, the, the biggest one I managed uh, in any time was the Kowloon Shangri-La in Hong Kong when I first came to Asia, and that was 720 rooms, 8 bars and restaurants, and 1,300 staff reporting to, to me. Wow. Um, that's a lot of people. That's a lot. Of, <laughs> sounds like a lot of stress, actually. Well, you know, you get used to it. You work, you work into it. And um, uh, for me, it was actually, I have to say, probably one of the easiest assignments because, um, you know, we had a lot of good people there. I have to say that. And even I haven't been working with them for over 30 years now. We still get together as, as like a team, as a family. Uh, and I think that's very important because I grew up in a village. So I understand the village mentality. And you know, in England, the, the pub and was really a, a civic center, a community center. And as I said to the students today, you know, I grew up in the situation where the guests became our friends and the people we worked with became our family. So I always take that spirit of hospitality with me wherever I go around the world and try and inculcate it into the way we operate our resorts and how we interact with the people uh, that I come into contact with. 
Well, you and I actually met in Yap in June. Uh, you were the keynote speaker at, I believe it was the Yap Homecoming Festival, one of their two major festivals during the year. And um, your, your message was very inspirational. And it, it's related to you being the guardian of sanctuary resorts. What is, what is it to be the guardian of sanctuary resorts? And, and what, what are you doing now in the industry? Uh, actually, I, um, as I said earlier, I'd done everything basically from a chef to a vice president in the hotel business, but I wasn't feeling fulfilled, and, and so I wanted to find a way that I could use my vocation to do more good in the community because I was also doing uh, some community service at the same time, and I wanted to see if there was a way of marrying my vocational work with my community service work. And so I, I thought through the process. I went on a retreat um, for nine days, and on the beginning of the nine days, I came up with a concept of sanctuary resorts where people balance their body, mind and spirit in an environmentally friendly space. So that's our vision and mission. And at the end of the nine days, I knew I was going to quit my job in the corporate world and go out and do what I think was the right thing to do. But use that training and experience over the previous uh, 25 to 30 years to really add value to communities where we worked and, and we operated. And, and for me, I think it was about creating a profitable business because I think it has to be a self-sustainable, profitable business because what I learned earlier on is if you're not profitable, you're not sustainable, then you're not around to do the good work. So we, we run a profitable business, but we want to use that business as a catalyst for community development. So we actually then reach out to the community and help support them and provide them opportunities to create additional supporting services such as organic farming or arts and crafts or, or just helping train the local vocational training school or, or the young people in that community to enjoy and to benefit from the um, experiences of tourism. Well, when we come back, uh, we want, let's talk a little bit about some of the resorts um, and, and that you have helped develop and uh, how they have impacted the communities they're in. But give us one more time that vision statement of Sanctuary Resorts. Well, as I say, Sanctuary Resorts um, was created to help people balance their body, mind and spirit in an environmentally friendly space. And when I started the company, uh, a friend of mine, he said to me, he said, so, so what's your title going to be? Chairman, president, it's your company. I said, no, no, I came from the corporate world. I don't want a big organization or a fancy title. I just want to guard the integrity of the concept. And he turned around to me and he said, well, then you should be guardian of the sanctuary. <laughs> and that's where my, my title came from. And I took it as a gift because it's been very good to me. Well, we'll be back with Andrew Jones after this break. Did you know that you can donate up to $5,000 to the Humanities Council through the CNMI Education Tax Credit Program? Donations from individuals and corporations qualify and can be used to offset your local wage and salary tax, BGRT, and earnings tax. Call our office at 235-4785 to see how you can support humanities programs in our community and obtain a tax credit for your donation. Sizu Usma'asi, Olomai, and thank you. Your Humanities Half Hour. We are actually recording here at Pau Pau Beach with a guest to island, Mr. Andrew Jones. He's the immediate past chairman of PATA, Pacific Asia Travel Association, and also guardian of sanctuary resorts. So, um, Andrew, tell us a little bit about some of the um, resorts you have helped develop and their impact or service to the communities in which they were developed. To be honest with you, uh, a number of our resorts uh, have been towards the higher end because they're small, they're boutique. So in order to have a self-sustainable business model, you have to go to more the higher end of the market, right, first of all. But uh, more than that, it's the impact that they have on the community that is very important as in, ingrained into our business plan. It's not a, an add-on CSR program or, or a marketing uh, activity. It's, it's how we do our business. Right. So and people say to me, so how do you find your resorts? And, and I'm not trying to be smart, but I say to them, well, actually, they find me half the time or most of the time. And, and it's basically a philosophy of we want to add value to the community. We want to to help share the abundance that we can we can provide through tourism, because I believe that tourism can be a force for good in the communities. And I believe that 
you know, by expanding tourism into an area, uh, we can actually provide good uh, and solid and consistent um, lifestyle for everybody involved. Um, so I'll give you a couple of examples. We, we've actually been very fortunate because we've had two of our resorts were listed when they opened in the 100 Best in the World by Condé Nast Traveller. When they opened? When they opened. When they opened. And I actually think sometimes, although they were very impressive architecturally and we gave five-star services, I think it was more about the philosophy that gained us that uh, image and reputation. Because 20 years ago when I started doing this, it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't thought of actually it was sort of rather um cutting not cutting edge but you know rather um weird <laughs> <laughs> yeah well well i did get a few funny looks from the corporate people i used to work with i can tell you that but 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 that's what i believed in and i felt it was the right thing to do so you know you just got to do it sometimes and, and get on with it we've had a couple of interesting uh, opportunities where say in cambodia um in siem reap I was I was doing some work on a project there, but also talking to some government and, and NGOs about the problems that they were experiencing at the time with child sex tourism and trafficking in women. And uh, what happened was that we, we were able to get hold of a, an old post office uh, guest house building, and um, and we didn't know what to do with it. And I I basically said, well, you know, um, our ho bigger hotel project was a bit delayed so why don't we just use this as a training uh, uh, facility but instead of just training for our own staff train the community and so what we did was we set up this 18 rooms as a, as a small hotel little guest house a bit upmarket guest house I'd say 18 rooms but from that we felt we could then uh, set up and uh, develop a training school a vocational training school for these young people that were either at risk from being put onto the street um, or trafficked um, in the community. So what we did was we set up this um, training, free training for these young people. We got free. Some, it was free training. Yes. Oh yeah. It was free training, and basically um, the hotel would support that training program. We do 26 students every every six to nine months, and then they could go and work anywhere. It wasn't it wasn't they had to work with us. We then found them jobs in other hotels around CM Reap, and and that worked uh, quite well. I mean, unfortunately, when we first started, we couldn't find any of, of these young people to come and take the free training, and that was a lesson learned because what we found out was that the that the NGOs were saying the the young people won't come because there's no money to feed the family. So actually, um, they're not interested in careers and six months from now, they say, how am I gonna feed the family now? So what we did was we gave them a small stipend for the students and a, a bag of rice for the family to feed them every so often uh, so, the free, so the students could come and have the free training. And, and, and you know, you think that's okay and it's job done and that's fine. But actually, what happened was something that we hadn't actually imagined was the guests who came and stayed at this guest house and learned about the vision and mission of what we were doing then started to look to other ways to help support these young people and, and their families. And we ended up uh, helping to support 12 villages, did several hundred water wells to provide water and sanitation for these, these um, village people and raised about half a million dollars from donations of the guests. So we had a business model that was profitable. We were able to support the training school through that business model. And then we had the additional ripple effect of helping in other ways to support the families. And, and it was a win-win for everybody. Was, was um, getting the kids to come in um, and finding that they needed food to feed their families the only uh, obstacle that you had in this particular project? Well, I mean, you know, I don't want to oversimplify it. There was other challenges. We, we were very fortunate because we had some industry people that we knew and, and you know, I've been in the business for a long time. So they could donate some of the equipment we needed. Uh, we hired a good chef who was willing to donate his time to do the training and set up the programs for us. A lot of people sort of in the industry came together to support the initiative because, as I say, in those days, there wasn't a lot of this uh, going on. Now you see more and more of it and I have to say I'm very happy to see more of these sort of um, uh, social ventures I'll call them uh, developing and, and helping out you know we had to 
get around some government bureaucracy in some of these ju uh, jurisdictions uh, and you know of course corruption is is I have to say quite endemic in some of these communities so we had to sort of go around that we don't participate in any of that we were very strict and and we we made sure that we we followed the law and the rules but we we also didn't engage in you know unfair or unjustifiable practices uh, so some of those things yeah you you came across and had to find ways around and uh, and and better way but where there's a will there's a way and um, and we felt that, that it was a meaningful uh, and important thing to do to help support communities and and um, you know it, it's still going on now today a lot of our listeners are um, from the Philippines or maybe they've visited there and they're familiar with the island of Cebu and you recently helped uh, develop a project there yes um, in Cebu um, in a place called Dambantayan which is the top north uh, of the island of Cebu, Cebu. Um, uh, the local owners um, were developing a resort there and they wanted some help uh, with it so I got involved with uh, helping them to create um, a concept for this area of northern Cebu um, and again we use the sanctuary concept of body mind spirit environmentally friendly and it's really close to a place called Malapasqua which is a small island a smaller island where it, which is the home of the thresher shark and for those of the seafaring uh, people on, in the audience uh, this is one of the few places in the world you can see the, the thresher shark Malapasqua is known as the home of the thresher shark sometimes it's called the kung fu shark because of the way it feeds and it flips its tail it has a very extended tail fin and it flips the, the um, tail to stun the fish and then that's how it, it eats and, and it's, a, it's quite unique really unique shark and, and they have some issues there because some of the local fishermen they use bombing and, uh, and chemical um, uh, fishing techniques and so we wanted to bring them away from that type of thing because it's very important for islands um, wherever they are to, to maintain and look after the, mar the marine life and so we're working with the Department of Tourism for the Philippines and, and some local tour operators and dive operators and by working together as a team we're able to secure a marine sanctuary around these areas um, to help regenerate the coral and, and to look after the the biodiversity of the area so again we've used the resort as a catalyst for community development for marine conservation and for helping the local community develop organic farming um, arts and crafts we work with a local vocational training school to help them to um, develop tourism and, and hospitality related programs now uh, with the disclaimer that you've actually only been here a couple days at least this your first visit right <laughs> um, what what potentials what opportunities and what challenges uh, would you say uh, Saipan specifically has um, based on your experience well um, you know it's, it's is it the glass half full or half empty uh, for me I come to a place like Saipan and I see a variety of different opportunities um, you know uh, from the wonderful marine um, aspects of, of the being part of the island life um, and from the vegetation uh, of the island it's a very natural and beautiful island and the people are very hospitable I was really taken uh, by that that sense of hospitality from day one from when I was picked up at the airport and driven to my hotel uh, the interaction with the driver Lionel I mean he, I'm staying at the Fiesta Hotel uh, you know great guy and and you know really personable right so that was a great welcome and when you have that it makes a big difference the first impression is always the most you know most endearing or not depending was for me it was a great a great start to a, a wonderful few days and it just went on from there I mean we went to the museum and I, I remember this because you know uh, we were knocking on the door and, and Danny came out and he said yeah sure come on in it's, it's closed but you know uh, you know he opened it up for us and he showed us around and you know that's the attitude that you want to see in tourism I mean uh, I think I, I've said to other people you know as a manager or as a leader in hospitality I hire attitude 
and then I train skill because if you hire people with good attitude then you can they'll learn any skill and you know and it's much easier so it's it's about working with people with great attitude and there is a great island attitude here of community and support and I think that's important so so I see a lot of talent and as a manager you know in in greeting people and looking at different people you know I'm always trying to assess okay are these people do they have good attitude and part of my job as a manager is to identify those people with good attitude and help them to develop help support them to maximize their potential because then it's a win-win for everybody of course the CNMI has unique challenges with the labor difficulties we are facing but it's nice to hear uh, your first impression that there is something about the islands that you feel is unique and beautiful and and has a lot of potential for us yeah I, I'm really impressed I mean as I say first time uh, great welcome but also uh, I've had a chance to see some of the flora and fauna we went to the Ed Benito Ed, Ed Benito uh, Benita, uh, Bonita Park the Bonita Park Ed Bonita Park and uh, and that was really a, an eye-opening uh, experience because I could see the natural vegetation and the variety of vegetation and you know you got a really good feeling about about the the whole area right and so that that's one thing uh, say the museum was a wonderful experience and so you know, and we talked about the sugarcane uh, plantation and the little train that used to run around. And, you know, I think uh, from that we had a discussion about whether that would be a unique tourism attraction here if it could get re restarted, right? Because that's what people are looking for. I, 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 in my talk, I, uh, I did tell people about the Pata uh, report on millennials, right, and, and what they're looking for in travel. And they want something authentic. They want something that's real. They want to engage in community activities to learn about the local cuisine, about, you know, the food festivals or, or other activities. Uh, today, we had a great exhibition of a dance performance of the Carolinian style of dancing so that was really good by the students and and that actually showed that they are interested and they are supporting of the heritage and culture of their island so that's very positive um, I got I, I have to say I got a very good feeling from the feedback at the summit and and I know that going forward this island is in good hands well, thank you so much for coming and sharing your expertise with the students um, at the summit. And um, of course, these are my Marion as youth welcome all visitors enthusiastically club students from our local schools. Um, and thank you for your time. We hope to see you in the Commonwealth again. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm really, I'm really happy that I had the opportunity to come and visit here. I want to thank MTech and and all those involved in in organising the summit. I know it was a lot of hard work, but it went off very well. Very, it was handled very professionally, and I think it was a really worthwhile opportunity to interact with the young people of this community. So thank you for inviting me, and I look forward to returning to Saipan very soon. Our guest today has been Andrew Jones. This has been Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Mm -hmm.